Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to Project Management Think Tank. This is where we talk about all things project management. We have with us my awesome buddy, Mark, and also we have Susan, who will be here very soon. But Mark, before Susan joins us, why don't we jump in and give a, a little overview about who we are and uh, what uh, we have done in our careers so far? Okay. You got it all right there. <laughs> <laughs> so again, I, I got my PMP way back in 95, version one of the Pembacat, as we were saying a few minutes ago. Um, my career was with HP, Hewlett Packard. Um, I took an early package out of, out of HP in, two, in 2007, and I started teaching. Couldn't I knew I didn't want to retire at that time, but... Um, what to do next. So I started teaching PMP prep classes for Velocity Teach and uh, another company. And then I decided to create my own sets of materials and it really started doing that in around 2010 and 11, up until now, up until uh, kind of the new um, program from uh, the ATP program from PMI just kind of turned over the Apple cart and upset things. And uh, mm -hmm. so I'm still, uh, Kind of re-engineering and figuring out what I'm going to do next uh, moving forward, uh, teach agile classes or put together more hybrid classes, things like that going forward. I decided I didn't want to teach the uh, ATP PMP prep stuff. Um, so next steps. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Great stuff. So Mark, that's a long time. Are you still as enthusiastic as you were in 95 when you just got <laughs> PMP? How, how, how are you feeling? Just to be perfectly honest about the industry. Let's not even go PMI yet. Let's just talk industry. How do you feel industry-wise about project management? Yeah, well, I feel exactly the same about that. I think project management is incredibly important. Um, today and has been and is today currently and will continue to be uh, incredibly important as, uh, as we move into the future. I think, um, you know, there's more and more emphasis on uh, soft skills, people skills. What does that reduce to? You know, the most important part of that foundation of all that is communications and stuff and that's really that's the most important skill set for a project manager right absolutely yeah and for technical i was a technical guy i was a systems engineer and what's the most important part for communications that technical people like moi have <laughs> a lot of trouble with what is that <laughs> listening <laughs> and stuff so all good communicators are necessarily very very good listeners uh, i've got three boys and i tell them so two of them the two older ones are in it and doing all that. And my youngest one is actually uh, in a construction company, manages a uh, CAD team, 3D ah. CAD in construction. But um, I tell them, guys, the world is changing. So dog on fast, right? Agile, volatility, new technologies. And I say, if you just stay technical, if you're in IT and you're technical, it is really hard. It's a game of leapfrog, right? And it's very hard to just stay current and stay up with that. And things are being outsourced. Things are being automated. It's scary where I, AI might take us. Yes. Mm. And things. And I say the one thing that really protects you uh, with companies or your own company, if you choose to go that way, are the soft skills. You know, I think companies today are desperate for people that have good communication skills. You know, I think there are a lot of yeah. graduates out of four-year colleges today that can't write a decent paragraph. That's true. That's grammatical, that says yeah. something cogent mm -hmm. and stuff. And I think companies are desperate for people that can do that, do the customer handling, um, can put together a good presentation and then oops, even better, stand up in front of an audience like Phil does all the dog on time extemporaneously and speak and uh, handle, you know, that customer relationship, that situation. 
So if you can couple good project management skills today with other technical skills, IT skills, engineering skills, wow, to me, that's a gangbuster mm. combination if you've mm. got that. And you can go anywhere you want with your own company, developing your own company or, you know, working for a, a large corporation even, and it's going to work. Mm. So I think that's very important. Thanks on the downside of things, I've been, as you know, I've been a longtime volunteer with PMI. So involved with the DC chapter since right after I got my PMP in wow. So Wow. Wow served on the board uh, with the DC chapter and all sorts of different uh, roles, uh, VP of programs, VP of professional development, education. I was trustee of the chapter from 2009 to 2013. And uh, a, a very loyal, strong supporter of all things PMI. Mm. But these recent changes since 2000, um, since 2021, and the ATP program and the change in the test, I feel like, again, that's thrown a huge curveball to small training companies like mine. And, uh, and I think it's also wasn't good or it's tough for the chapters to deal with that. What are chapters doing today yeah. regarding PMP prep training? What do you see, Phil, in, in your travels? To be, to be perfectly honest, I haven't heard a lot of buzz about it. I've heard a few chapters saying, I think out in other parts of like North America going up Canada. But as far as my local chapter, I really haven't heard of any PMP classes like before. Right. You know, and I think it's all as a result of the new, new developments. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so they I, don't. Why would they do that since uh, they've got to pay? They too, I think, would have True. to pay PMI they would have to pay. a student. And yeah. this used to be their reason for being. Mm -hmm. And one of their, and for the smaller chapters, this was one of their biggest um, financial uh, enterprises, one of the biggest ways that they made money for a long time. So that's, that's kind of gone. Yes. It, it ha yeah, it has. That's true. It's very unfortunate, you know. Speaking about um, the way things have progressed, um, let's go down. Let's go down memory lane. Um, I'll do my quick intro, and then we'll go down memory lane, Mark. I want you to begin thinking. I'm going to ask you questions about the past, present, and future because you've been here since '95 in the PMI world. So we're going to talk about the transitioning between CEOs and some of the high points. <laughs> So get start loading that gun, Mark. <laughs> start loading it. I'm coming. I'm this coming. is dangerous, da dangerous <laughs> territory, Phil. <laughs> it, ha it has to be reviewed. So, you know, I'm Mr. Controversy. So let's do that. But let's um <clears throat> let's talk about um, my background. I got on the scene exactly 10 years after Mark did in 2005. I got certified in 2005. And as soon as I got certified, I started helping people pass the exam. I was at the time just coming out of a number of jobs and I decided to kind of sit back for some months and, and let it uh, stew in what I had just done. And then I, I went for an interview with Honeywell and that's where more fun began. And I got about 50 of my colleagues certified. I didn't have to, wasn't part of my job, but I enjoyed the PMP journey so much. And I saw some of them failing, just trying, struggling. And at the time, Honeywell said, well, if you don't get the PMP certification, you're going to be limited in what you can do. Oh, yeah. um, so um, at the end of the day, I decided to go ahead and uh, uh, start helping some of my, my students get uh, certified. So um, my colleagues certified. So they became my students. I got 50 of them certified. And after that, I had the opportunity of working with all sorts of companies. Um, worked at Skillsoft. That made a big impression as a contractor. Saw what Skillsoft was doing, enjoyed it, and thought, I'd like to do this more. And just started partnering more with some of my colleagues. Emily, who you, who you might see on this channel, was a colleague at Skillsoft. We decided to partner up and train more firms worldwide, and we did that. And uh, since 2009, I've been really focused, laser-focused on helping people get certified, pass the exam, you know, and I hold about 10 of PMIs, uh, 10 certifications, some of them are PMI. So from PMI, I hold the, the PMP, the RMP, the SP, the ACP, the CAPM, and the OPM3. Wow. So that, that's six of them. The OPM3, they discontinued it, much to my 
<clears throat> much to my disappointment because I spent a lot of money getting OPM3 certified. It was a really great certification, made a lot of sense. But as usual, you know, with the transitions of CEOs and personnel at PMI, people always think there's a better mousetrap, a cleverer idea. So we often see very drastic switchings going on. They just switch from one thing to another. So let's talk about the 90s as you remember it, Mark. And let's talk about when uh, Virgil Arcada was uh, CEO. Any recollections around that time? No, um, don't. <laughs> I don't have anything. You know, How were things back them. then though, as far as uh, the PMI? Were, were they chapters? Were people actively engaged in uh, collaborating across, across boundaries and stuff? Yeah, very, very much, and uh, and I think the feelings were very positive. The the chapters felt like a global um, GOC, as we call it, global operating center, was uh, supporting us quite well. Um, the global Congress meetings, you, I'm sure you've been to a global Congress meeting, yes? Not yet. Not yet. Well, those were those were excellent, and they would have uh, before the. Global Congress meeting started per se, they would have a leadership meeting, like a two and a half day leadership meeting there too. And that was just super. They would bring in speakers, uh, excellent speakers, um, a number of tracks. And I felt like there was a, a, you know, it was very good chemistry, synergy, if you will, uh, between the chapters and global. We were working together. Again, most, I think almost all the chapters were very much uh, in support of what PMI was doing mm. and the certifications. And I think that was true through uh, Greg Balistrero. Okay. Uh, since we're here in DC, and since we're so close to mm -hmm. Philadelphia, where their headquarters are, we they would actually invite um, a number of our board members up each year. Mm. So they typically go up for a full day of meetings with a lot mm. of you know, heads of their different certifications nice. and talk about their direction and vision and where they're lovely, going. Lovely, lovely. Now, do you that see a lasted, low? You see a low that in lasted, that? That lasted up until uh, Mark, Mark There you Langley go, there you go, there that. you go. Yep, yep, yep. And when Mark came in, that uh, he started, no, we can't, uh, that's showing a little too much favoritism. <laughs> 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 and we were the elephant in the room, the, the giant in the room. We were, uh, even at that time, we were about 10,000 members, the largest chapter in the world. And uh, wow. Wow. But then I think Mark thought that, uh, you know, they were doing maybe a little too much. Um, Favorite is huh? So Mark was Mr. Mr. Uh, code of Ethics. So he, he really brought awareness of the Code of Ethics and fairness and, and honesty, and it was big on his radar. But, yeah, uh, yeah. but apart from, um, you know, those meetings and so on, Personally, I felt Mark's, you know, the departure Mark was like, in my mind, the end of an era, yeah, the end of an era of the golden, <laughs> the, the golden era, you know, because things started feeling less uh, charismatic, you know, right. it seemed like going more going through the motions of a, an organization. And I don't know why, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to say it was one person's, uh, you know, uh, uh, doing, it's just the organization as a whole. Actually, when Sunil joined, I remember feeling quite excited watching his, you know, uh, weekly or, or monthly podcasts. And then I don't know whether to blame COVID. I don't know what, you know, what it was, but things just became pretty, pretty, pretty different. You know, I don't know if you felt that. Susan, welcome. Before we go any further, let's introduce our awesome panelist. Susan, welcome. I'm glad you joined. You get my frantic, frenzied <laughs> messages. I'm glad that you're here with us. She's very busy. So she's a professor and she does all sorts. So Susan, tell us, were you, were you speaking to some big company somewhere? <laughs> Massive well webinar? Is a little bit of a transition. I'm, I'm moving off of one uh, contract onto another. So it was a, a meeting with some uh -huh. things around that. And, uh, you know, I guess it's just like sort of wishful thinking. You're like, oh, it's Friday afternoon. We're not going to have a long meeting. Well, so much <laughs> for that. That, that, that didn't happen. Um, I'm always doing 20 things. So, um, yes, I, I do. I teach also. I just finished up a semester. So anybody who's 
who's taking graduate classes, you know, just know that your professors go through a equal pain that you go through. <laughs> it just, it's just delayed by like three or four days after you submit your assignment. Oh my um, goodness. How, how quickly do you mark those finals? Gosh, they, I, sometimes I have three days. Sometimes I have five days. Um, the, the, I had, to be honest, I had, I had four classes that, that all ended within a one and a half week period. So I did not get much sleep. And wow. so, Susan, what's your average work week? Is it 70? Is it above 70? Um, what? I, when I add it together, it's like 110, but I can't oh possibly gosh. putting in 110 hours. So I'm doing something quicker than, it's probably the teaching because I've done it for so long. Um, it's, it's supposed to be like 10 hours of class, but I probably spend a little bit less time because I have a lot of, um, a lot of like tricks and things that I do to, be efficient you know after you teach a class for for a while you're more efficient but i i don't know i was actually i was actually talking to a like a executive coach about kind of trying to squeeze more time in and mm. he's like no i think you're about maxed out on that he's like i think <laughs> i think you literally have to prioritize and remove something and and i actually i do have a strategy now and what what hurts the most is that mark and i have a project that we've been working on for a while and i'm, I'm i keep thinking i'm gonna get a phone call one day mark's like <laughs> I replaced you with someone else. You know? <laughs> so it's like my heart's in it, but I'm just like, I don't have time. So, anyway, um, and, it, and it's funny because as a project manager, I have to be good at time management. So I'm like, how come I can't do this? And it's like, literally, the, it took this ex executive coach saying to me, like, you know, there is literally like a finite amount of time. And you, kind of <laughs> you can't expand it. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm sleeping six and a half to seven hours a day. So it's, it's like each night. So like, that's really that's about it. Like if you do less than that, like there's things start falling apart. Yeah. Yeah. You know? And, and Saturday and Sunday are work days. They're just work days where I walk my dog for longer. So, you know, wow. um, I'm sure not everybody wants to listen to all this, but no, 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 no. It's very good balance and context for someone like me who is in yep. a similar boat and, um, yeah, you're getting six and a half. That's very good. You're disciplined <laughs> to get, to make sure you do that because it, it can be hard. You know, but I but I, I want to talk a little bit more about the, the consulting stuff that you do. So you you teach everything under the sun in project management, agile, hybrid. You and Mark wrote the hybrid book, predictive. What else do you teach? Um, so you named all the things, you know, some traditional project management stuff. Like right now I'm teaching a, a class in cost and schedule management. Okay. Um, and I just got um, done teaching um a risk management course so that's another passion and and i'm also teaching a course on virtual uh virtual projects and virtual teams so that that's okay. that's actually a lot of fun um i've always been interested in it but now people have a particular interest all of a sudden because people who said oh i'll never work virtually uh, mm -hmm. now they have to so you know uh -huh. we gotta we gotta learn how to make it work how to use the tools and things like that and and I get to, so then I take that into my contract space. So I do federal contract work. I take it into that space and, you know, I'm working on virtual teams and I do things mm. like pick up the phone and call people. How's it going? What'd you <laughs> call about? Nothing. Just see how you're doing. Lovely. But I'll tell you what, I just helped transition a team that came from another contract and we've had only one person left and they left within a week of starting on that contract, which meant they already had that job. We all know mm -hmm. that doesn't happen that quickly. <laughs> yeah. everybody, else, everybody else is still there. And to me, that says a lot about how we transition them in. They felt listened to. Like that's a big thing. And when people are remote, they often don't feel listened to. And so mm -hmm. I love taking the textbook stuff and applying it to the real situation. And then I love the real situations that show up at work, like the insanity of... <laughs> Well, we want you to be agile, but we want a Gantt chart. And you're like, okay, this makes no sense together, right? So, but this is the reality of work. And so that's why I love the contract stuff and the teaching stuff. And I'm basically at that point in my career, which which I know that the two of you are, and I, Mark's got more gray hairs than me, but I've, I've got a, few. a lot um, more. But, uh, but uh, you know, you're at that point where like things come to you. It's like, I'm not beating the pavement looking for work. I just have opportunities that show up. And it's very hard to say no 
Mm. It's like a kid in a candy store. Like from a project management perspective, I have stuff that comes to me all the time that I'm like, oh, I want to do that. Oh, I want to do that. And so <laughs> literally my challenge is like, how can I get more time in the day? Um, mm. Mark and I want to write a sequel to our book. Nice. Um, you know, this this right here, like I, the reason, part of the reason we're doing this panel is because I was so inspired by, I get, I get these things like early in the morning because mm. whatever time zone fills on. So I get these things early in the morning and it's like, oh, this is the thing about the talent triangle. I was just like, man, I think he's so dead on about that. Like, there's, I'm like, leadership? Like, why would you remove the word leadership? Like, what are you thinking? I mean, that, that, that's what I apply to keep mm. these people who transition on that contract. That's, that's what leadership looks like. Leadership looks like, hey, how's it going? What can I do to help you? What can I do to make your life better? Mm -hmm. Are you challenged? Are you interested? What do you what do you see as your future being? Do you like the people you're working with? I mean, you know, you just got to ask those questions. I mean, even if they answer something I don't like, at least I know. Mm -hmm. I'd rather know. I'd rather know they're leaving than find out after I get the resignation letter and then I got to backfill them. And mm -hmm. so, you know, those are the things that at the end of the day, it's not like, do I know how to write a, a WBS? Do I know how to create a schedule? Like, those aren't the things, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's leadership, communication, risk management, and, and applying these tools and knowing what to ap apply when. Exactly. Which is the other bad thing. Cause now everybody's like, Oh, agile, I'll just use it everywhere. And like, well, <laughs> that may or may not be a good idea. You know, and that that's, that's what inspired Mark and I to, to write about hybrid is like, may or may not be a good idea to do that. So. Absolutely. Um, Let's talk about that book really quick, because I know some folks are on the East Coast and they need to jump back into work. So I just want them to know that they can get this book on Amazon. Uh, I got my copy on Amazon. And I also yeah, want I would to have know. Mailed you one. <laughs> huh? I would have mailed you one. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. It's, it's just a pleasure to buy a book you believe in, you know, because there's a lot of baloney out there. You might as well get some really good expensive beef prime cut you know that's <laughs> so, uh, so as far as contacting us you can get hold of mark at that uh email and if you want to get hold of susan as well just email mark and he'll be able to put you in touch with susan i don't have susan's email up on the screen but again the book there it is hybrid project management it's just totally awesome to have a uh, good publication from trusted individuals and one of your pieces of work mark your agile acp exam some of our students in the next few days they're going to be crying because i'm going to be giving them some of those questions that you wrote and those questions are hard mark what were you doing when you wrote those questions <laughs> a cool thing with that was still <laughs> I, I did something much smarter than, than well i couldn't with the pmp because i took the pmp in 1995 and I didn't create my materials for the PMP until what, 2010, 2000, wow. started creating them. And then they evolved. Mm. You know, I put thousands of that, like you, and so I put mm. thousands and thousands of hours into the PMP wow. prep class that's now sitting on the shelves and stuff, but wow. we cry about that. So with the agile stuff, with ACP stuff, guess what? I started writing uh, practice test questions within weeks. After taking, mm. So it was fresh in my mind. So I knew how tricky, you know, they could get. Mm. And I felt my impression was that the uh, agile test questions were difficult, not but not as difficult as the PMP, maybe not as quite as nuanced. And uh, I thought the ones the PMP, you wrote, Mark, the ones you wrote, they were harder. <laughs> and I want and I want our viewers to know what I'm talking about. I'm not going to show them the answers, but I want them to know what I'm talking about. And one of my awesome PLI members, because you know I formed the Project Leadership Institute, Michelle is on here. And Michelle was one of those poor students who had to feel the brunt of some of Mark's questions. She's now PMP. She's now PSM. So she's she's all indoctrinated into the mindset of, of what it would take. But for people watching, take a look at some of these. They, they're very borderline. Just even worse than what PMI would do. I'm glad <laughs> PMI has not engaged you, Mark, uh, to write <laughs> questions for them. Uh, some of these questions are absolutely yeah. yeah. mind-bending. They, they're scary. In fact, they're so scary. I had a poem from showing them to people 
getting ready for the PMP, I had to save them for our ACP people. So Mark, once again, thanks for sharing your knowledge with me personally and uh, helping us Pleasure, to get buddy. our people better Yeah, for the ACP. So do you still train the ACP, Mark? Uh, I'm going to let Susan answer that. <laughs> um, Mark has some wonderful material, which he allows me to use to, to teach the PMI ACP. So I've been teaching that for years. And actually, I got my ACP so I could teach it. Wow. And, and, it's, and I was laughing kind of when Mark was saying he was, he was coming up with questions, because what I do is when I finish a certification, you know, I leave the exam place or shut off my computer. I take a piece of paper and pen and start writing down things like not necessarily questions, but things that things that I that I wish I'd realized that I should have studied for. Yeah. And that I could be like the eyes and ears for for my students. So right. I, I'm, I'm very much thinking about like, ooh, what could I tell myself right now before I pick up the phone, before I do anything? I just start writing, writing, writing. And it's been very helpful to me because there are things that you forget that you saw mm -hmm. on the exam. And so, um, so yeah, I, I think, I thank Mark for that, but I, I agree with you. Those, those are, those are tough <laughs> questions there, Mark. But they, you know what? I'd rather the practice questions be tough than yeah. easy. Oh yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. There's a lot of stuff about Kanban. Mark, look, Kanban, whip, uh, seven wastes. I mean, <laughs> it, it was your questions that made me go open and take a look again at the seven wastes. Cause those are That's very good, good. Yeah. That's good stuff. So did you so, go for a course in, when you were taking the ACP, Mark? Did you go for training? Um, I did it all. You had to. You had to, Phil. Um, I felt very confident I could pass the test without taking a class. I was pretty talk unsure that I could. But um, they know to get the contact hours that mm. you needed, you had to have a formal class and a certificate. So I took a, a class from um, uh, just one of the fairly big uh, trainers. Um, okay. P PM training okay. had a class. Actually, they subcontracted a class from wow. another company. And actually, it was a wrong fit. The class that they were doing was for the older version of the test. So they switched oh. versions. And the test that the course I took was for the older oh. RDS, the older stuff. Yeah. But it didn't matter. Um, it, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I, have a, to... I have a tip for people. So if they if they know Agile well, but they, they don't want to take that class like he had to take to get the hours, another thing you could do is you could take a scrum master and a product owner class, those, those will credit you. So if you, if you want to do it that way, and I actually have known some people to get like their CSM first, or I prefer the PSM mm -hmm. on level one with scrum.org, but, you. um, and you don't have to take a class for that. But the point is, is you can, you can use these to kind of double duty you. So you can That's get what I did. Mm -hmm. a scrum cert and then use those educational hours to help get yeah, other cert. Exactly. I did my CSM and that helped me with the hours I needed to, yeah. Good, good point, so, Susan. And I would love for Michelle to chime in or whoever else can or, or would, but I would like to hear from you guys where you think things might be going. You know, we're all trying to read the tea leaves mm. and stuff. <laughs> um, where do you think things are going? Do you think, like, here's, do you think version seven, there are a lot of rumors that, that uh, version seven materials will start appearing on the test, but from the companies that I work with, um, and some are ATPs, so far they're saying no, they're not getting any feedback from students that version seven is on the test yet, though there's rumors that that's gonna happen. PMI just recently published something saying they're gonna finally archive or mothball version six, <laughs> they're sending it out to pasture. And so does that mean that uh, version six, so the knowledge areas, the 10 knowledge areas, the five process groups, well, I guess the five process groups are still in uh, version seven. Hi, Michelle, <laughs> welcome back. But uh, is that gonna disappear? Are the 10 knowledge areas and the five process groups, questions on that? That's gonna be, to me, that's a real shame yeah, that all goes away. Yeah, it's gonna, it's gonna be difficult. I Man, I was just talking to uh, one of my students and one of my university students, and he was saying how 
wow, I wish everybody in my in my organization could learn the same project management stuff that I just learned in this course, in the mm-hmm. project management course. And I said, yeah, you know, that that consistency, like having everybody with the same vocabulary, the same taxonomy that they know. But if if that goes away, like I, I I'm just going to keep talking like that. And then eventually, like the young people are going to think I'm crazy. And that's right. I guess that's when I'll put in my retirement. <laughs> like I just because I, I'm like, I just don't understand how else. I'm not saying that version seven isn't a useful work. Mm. It's just not a replacement of version six in my mind. So for this, I, I, want, it's... I want Michelle to pitch in. So let me go ahead and introduce Michelle and brag on her a little bit. She's one of my members from the Project Leadership Institute. She got certified last year and she was very instrumental in helping us identify the brilliance in Mark's questions, uh, mind-blowingness. So Michelle was one of my first victims for that exam uh, that Mark wrote. So Michelle uh, gave me a lot of value feedback for our course because there was a lot of great content that we hadn't covered. So we went back to the drawing board, cover the content. And if you look for my videos on YouTube, you see that every now and again, I introduce some of Mark's questions. And my focus on what to introduce in Kanban was as a result of Michelle's feedback. So Michelle is one of our Project Leadership Institute members. I'm not done. I'm going to brag on her a little bit more. So Michelle is, is also an artist, right? And you see me pop up on YouTube, and I have all sorts of fancy backgrounds behind me. There's one fancy background that you recognize, this one. It's Michelle. This is Michelle's handiwork. So wow, she's cool. an artist. She, and you see this one as well. Every, wow. All of those fancy backgrounds, they're all Michelle's handiwork. So nice. Michelle, without much ado, welcome to the conversation. How does it feel to be a PMP in 2021, 22? It feels great. It feels great to be a PMP. Good, good. And what do you think about what Mark was saying about knowledge areas and and this thing right here, just pitch in. And yeah, just, well, just you. from what I've heard also from people who have been teaching the P- PMBOK for a long time, th- they're very like not in love with the s- seventh edition. And they're very concerned with where everything is going to go. And it almost seems like the seventh edition is just like an added side book and not really something that's going to push the project management forward like where are they going to go with this because what industry are they going to go with on this it's like they're taking away from the other exams that they have that have to do with agile or have to do with with any type of hybrid stuff so i'm kind of wondering where this is going to go too especially someone like me who's looking to move into a new career like I'm in the job market right now and I'm, it seems like a lot of companies don't exactly know what they're hiring for. Very good. Point. Are they hiring for a project manager, traditional waterfall? Are they hiring for an agile person? I'm getting questions from a lot mm-hmm. of companies that are kind of almost confused when I talk to Phil about it afterwards. So that, that's very true. Interesting. And what, what, uh, what Susan just said about the, what did you say about Gantt chart? They say they want to be agile, but they're yeah. asking you for Gantt chart. Yeah. Michelle experienced exactly that same thing a few days ago. And it's, it's mixed messaging. And honestly, I think, like Michelle said, this is a nice little side. Mm-hmm. You know, so the side. But again, you know, PMI, they keep diluting the good work people have done. Like, like Susan was saying, the knowledge areas. Why do you want to diminish it? I'm not... I'm not saying take it away because they will tell you it's in standards plus. Yes. Okay. You didn't take it away, but you've diluted it. You've, you've kind of compressed it to the point that people don't even know it exists. They say, Oh, domains. So let me go read domains. It's just, I don't know. Help me people help me. (laughs) Okay. So let me, let me jump in here, Susan. Sorry. Sorry. So they're Cynthia Stackpole, and I keep forgetting her. She remarried. She's got a new last name. So sorry, Cynthia. Um, she was the the project manager in PMI, I think, for version four of the PMBOK guide when that existed. And so with version seven, when version seven rolled out, she did an introductory talk 
about version seven, a podcast. And anyway, and she reminded us, or she said, the test was never, the, the PMP exam was never really about the PMBOK guides. That's not quite true, or that's a little disingenuous, but she said it was always about the role delineation study, which is also the um, examination content outline ECS. Well, that didn't come out, I don't think, until 2000 or early 2000s. So before that, it was based on the PMBOK guide. Now, the RDS, the role delineation study, up until recently, guess what? Until five years ago, the domains in the, there were five domains in the role delineation study. They were called domains, but guess what they were? Initiating, planning, mm. executing, monitoring, controlling, and closing. So they didn't call them process groups. They were called domains. And then they had within each quote unquote domain, they would have about 15 tasks underneath them. And guess what those tasks mapped onto? Pretty much. Process? ITTO? Yes. Yes. They kind of mapped onto processes and stuff, but it was only a 15, 16 page document and nobody getting ready for the test paid any attention at all to the role delineation study. It was, it was kind of crazy things that were missing. For mm. instance, there was no task for creating a scope statement. Mm. There was a task for getting requirements, no task for doing a scope statement. So they really should have cleaned that up. But they said, oh, we went to an independent body, not PMPs. We went out to um, a very senior, how did they put it? You know, very esteemed group. Uh, project management, uh, project managers, international people, they mm. gave us the role delineation study and the tasks and stuff. And so they said, you know, whatever they came up, we're in, it was independent and we had a hands-off attitude. Mm. Anyway, now they replaced that, as you know, um, and they cleaned it up in 2021. And the domains in the RDS now are people process mm -hmm. and business. So Michelle took that exam. You took that exam, Michelle, people process business. Neither of us took that exam. Mark, Susan, and I didn't take that exam, but Michelle did. And she was the, the first generation of the- 2021. Yeah, she was yeah. my January set of students. You know, so it's all different by then. And one of the things we did in the class was emphasize the role delineation study in the content outline. So we, we emphasize the content outline and um, that's what Michelle and her colleagues used to study. But another piece of the confusion, which um, you allude to, Mark, was in the time past, the PMBOK would map to the RDS or the content outline. Now there's no correlation between right. this right. and zero, but, which is why it's a, it's a white elephant because Susan and Mark, they know in the old times when the exam aligned to it more, even though PMI is saying it didn't, you would find one of these in every class. Yeah. Oh, you would, yeah. You'd find a PMBOK everywhere. Just ask people getting certified. Have you even half referred to it? No. Yeah. No. No. <laughs> so yeah. the proof of the pudding is in the Eden. No one's Eden. Well, the challenge is that um, universities who are, um, if, they're, if they're an ATP university, um, or even if they're, um, there's another registration they have for universities, they're, they're needing to align to seven. And, and actually, um, I won't say which one, but one of the universities, universities where I teach, um, myself and another instructor were like, you can't do this. And I literally, like, for risk management, I said, if we get rid of everything in there, like the processes for risk management, you have no risk management. <laughs> it's, it's just mentioned like a handful of times in seven. I'm like, What's that? Like, that's not risk <laughs> management. That's not a process. That's not a, you know, what? So I, I just, I, I'm still like, I'm, I'm hoping this is like new Coke. You know? <laughs> like, okay, that's yes. a bad idea. We're yeah, going to go back it, to full classic. Um, I don't know. They got quality, gonna... right, Susan? They got it quality. They got, they got it uh, contracts. I just, I, I'm not saying that this is not a, a decent work, but it's an it's like an addendum work. It is not an addendum. Really Thank you, Susan. That's a very diplomatic way of saying it. Thank you. Ah, you've given me a new one to use. 
it's an addendum. You need the main thing, the real yep. thing, the chapters one, two, and three, projects, programs, portfolios, well, broken down, you know? It's much more intuitive. The version six, the uh, 10 knowledge areas, the five process groups, the first two, three chapters, it's much more intuitive. They're building blocks. Yep. Yeah. And it was never, yeah. it was never intended. So this is true about the Pimbach guy going way back to it coming out in 1996. And actually there was a, a precursor of that that came out in 87. <laughs> and instead of saying guide to the Pimbach, 96 said guide to the Pimbach. And the earlier one in 87 said Pimbach. And then they realized the error of their ways. No, this can't, nothing, no <laughs> book can be the, the project management yeah, body of knowledge. All encompassing. A universe of literature. So they, they then called it a guide to the Pinbach. But they always emphasize very, very strongly that it's a framework, mm. that the Pinbach guide is not a menu, was yeah. never intended to be a menu of how to do a project. No, 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 no. Mm. It's much higher level, it's abstract. It sits a, underneath all the methodologies. So it sits underneath waterfall. It sits underneath um, rolling wave, other iterative forms. And it was intended, and they, the authors of version five, where they start mentioning agile for the first time, would have agreed or would have said, even in version five, that uh, the Pinbot guide supported agile. Supported. They would have said it supports all projects in all industries, under whatever contract type, under any type of contract, under any life cycle methodology, and no matter how simple or complex, they would have said that. And now, so, so why? So, what, so should, I, I guess my question now is so like, so what, do, what is a project manager? Like if somebody came to me and say, I wanna learn how to be a project manager, I want to point them to version six and, and I, I'm just, I'm, I'm going to cry the day that that's like, like removed from the site. I don't know. I don't know what I'm going to point people to. I would point them to some of the main books in Agile because I think Agile's so huge today and so mm -hmm. fundamental, so important. And so I feel like, you know, in version six, a mistake that was made, they didn't really fully integrate Agile. And yeah, I feel they, like they it's a good, the what they've done in, so yeah, what they've they, done in 2021 and Michelle has benefited from is they have integrated Agile to a much greater degree. In fact, the test today is 50-50 or some students say there's even more Agile yeah. on the so, test so, today. So that's challenging to me because then what does, I, I have them written down here because I've been thinking this myself. So then where does the ACP fall in, right? Yes. You've got, yes. And then you've got Discipline Agile. Yes. And then you've also got this new, like, what do they call it? Like a micro certification, the Agile Hybrid yes. Project. Hybrid, which, uh, and have I'm you like, looked so, at that? That's, to me, a joke. <laughs> I, I just, I mean, I, I actually, I, I recently was uh, speaking with somebody about it. They, they did a presentation on it. And I kind of said, well, where does this fit in with all this? And, and you know, it's, I guess if you, if you, if you just want to start from someplace, that would be a place to go. But for mm -hmm. someone like, any of us who've been doing stuff for a while, it's not a place to go, but it's just, it's so muddy now. The water's so mm. muddy because people have said to me, well, I don't see myself to doing a traditional project. Should I get a PMP or an ACP? Right. And, and I'm not really sure how to answer that. Like I, I tend right. to tell people, well, what is, go look for your purpose, perfect job or the job that you want. And what are they saying they need? If they say mm. they need a PMP, then go get a PMP. But if it's not saying that, I like the ACP if you know you're not going to use right. traditional because you get like a survey of like all these different agile methods, which is really great. Um, but then you're like, well, what about discipline agile? And I'm like, I think discipline agile one day could be something, but I don't feel like it's there yet. I feel like it's, it's, it's a little bit confusing at the moment. I think it's very heavy weight. It's over engineered and, and they went crazy. It's, it came from IBM. Yes. <laughs> They, they don't. They don't like that, us that saying that. That tells you a lot. That they don't. They don't like us. They don't like us saying that. But when you really boil it down, um, that that's pretty much what it is. But as far as what you said, Susan, I agree. The ACP is a good starting point. It's not overboard. It calls your attention to certain things. So Scrum, PSM, CSM, yes. But if you want to be more, perhaps more broad-minded, 
yeah, it, there's nothing wrong in ACP. We, we're currently training a class on ACP and we've got students coming for the ride. They know Scrum. One of them actually has got the Discipline Agile certification for the, uh, the more foundational one, uh, Scrum Master. But um, as you begin to go to the higher levels, people become confused about, okay, what, what is a value in the higher level ones over just the, the basic one? And when you really boil it down, Scrum is at the center of all of these right, sets. Right. Whether you want to spin the safe, you know, lumbering, blumbering, fumbling framework, or you want to spin uh, discipline agile, or you want to spin anything else that people claim is a scaling technique, it's Scrum at the heart. Right. They even forget about the manifesto, the value and the principles, because like in my mind, if you're really thinking values and principles, you don't even want to touch some of these frameworks because they're not truly embodying the agile mindset. Mm -hmm. They're processes and tools, big old fumbling, blumbering processes and tools. So my, my advice to anyone who really wants to start off, ACP is not a bad one, but from some of the feedback I've gotten over the years is uh, if you are not aware of some of the PMP 101 topics, uh, you could find a little bit tricky in some of the questions right. for those people who have encountered some like earned value. I mean, Susan, you've been for PS, you've taken a PSM and the CSM. There's no talk about earned value there. So it's going to throw someone who is from the pure world of, yeah. of Scrum or Agile off. Um, yeah. But going into how, you know, I think what PMI should have done is just focus on I'm giving them ideas here. Maybe, maybe I'll, I shouldn't give them the ideas. Well, you and I will talk about that <laughs> offline. But I feel they could have focused a little bit more on the agile practice guide and more of the value that that brings right. to introduce more of those things in the certification so that it can add as much value from different perspectives. Because the agile practice guide isn't just agile. It has some other things in it, like more hybrid. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So Phil, no, Susan... Is a lot, there's a lot of lean. Lean's been around like a lot longer right. than people actually were using the word agile. Um, and, and, and there's one thing I wanted to say, and then I'll like, I, Mark wanted to say something. Um, you said this the other day, Phil, and it really caught my attention. You go to agilemanifesto.org, it's got that old school, like it looks like they're signing the Declaration of Independence, like background that's like a little bit, it, it's actually like a little bit of a washed, um, tannish color. Like, that's okay. You don't have to reinvent and recreate everything. Exactly. Some are just good the way they are. Exactly. And, 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 and to me, one of the things that's neat about Agile is we've got, we've got the, the Agile manifesto statements. We've got the 12 principles. And guess what? You don't need to update them. Right. The wind <laughs> right. blew. So, right. like, like, I don't know, there's like, we got so many things going on in our world changing all the time. Can we just yeah. have that stay the same, yeah. you know? Um, so so I'm, I'm with you. I mean, you can change like how you actually bring that to fruition. You can be mm -hmm. creative, you can be innovative, but like there, there is something about, you know, I'm like an engineer, E equals MC squared. That didn't change. It doesn't have to change. <laughs> like you don't have to change it. You know what I mean? There's certain things that you just like, yeah. you kind of, Keep it the Don't way get me it going is. on that. But uh, Susan, Phil. So <laughs> unfortunately, Susan's working way too many hours. And I'm not, <laughs> I'm not gonna get any bandwidth from her. But <laughs> PMI's mistakes, PMI's shortcomings, guess what? Are leaving a tremendous opportunity for some bright young, very good educators and project management advocates like you two to step in and fill the doggone void <laughs> and uh, marry, do kind of what we were talking about in our hybrid book, marry the best concepts, take the best, most important foundational <laughs> concepts that we taught in a PMP prep class and marry that with ACP, marry mm -hmm. that with Scrum and Agile and then you have to get the backing and you need the community, the, the project management community to back that. You really need a, almost a new certification, perhaps a, a true hybrid. The digital, um, you know, disciplined, agile and safe, to me, they call themselves hybrid, but they're really hybrid agile. And they're really for enterprise, the enterprise level, large scale projects and stuff. You really need something that marries even waterfall 
traditional with agile and uh and and do that you know do that properly and that's mm -hmm. properly. that was a big part of what we were trying to do in our book but there's even there's a lot more work to be done there absolutely mark and uh yeah you're so you're so correct so we we have next on our agenda just to make sure we keep on our <clears throat> agenda we talked about Pembok guide 7th edition um we should also uh, talk about the concept of um, virtual project management because that's big. So let me go two steps back and let's talk about the virtual project management space. Uh, go back. Virtual project management. So Susan, I know you teach this quite a bit. Where do you want to start off with our today's world and everyone who is a project manager at one point or another has probably faced having to run project management virtually. Any, any advice and suggestions? Where do you see this headed? It's become a staple, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I think that the big thing is just like you would do with anything else, um, don't start with the tools, start with the need. Um, what are the results you're looking for? What are the things that you want to do with the environment you're working in? You know, we talk about enterprise environmental factors. That's, that's, what, that's what this means. It means look at the organization, look at the people. Um, what are the tools that you have to use or what are the tools that you need? What are you trying to, to get to? I find with virtual people almost, it's like they go grocery shopping without knowing what they're making for dinner. Mm. And they pick stuff that looks cool, that looks neat, like, oh, this is great. This is what's going to help us. And it's like, what's actually going to help you is having a charter of some sort, which states how are you going to communicate, when you're going to communicate, what are the rules of engagement, and then find tools to help support that. Uh, a lot of times, because I'm going into a customer, like a federal customer or another client, they have tools. I can't dictate the tools. I can just say, okay, these are the tools you have. Here's how I recommend using them. Um, and, and you create scenarios for that. So for example, um, you know, when I used to be in a cube next to somebody, you'd be like, hey, I got a question for you. Well, now I go on to Teams chat. Hey, I got a question for you. Same thing. So it, you just got to figure out what, what tool allows me to do the thing I was doing before that worked for me that I now seems like I don't have a way of doing that. You got you to gotta figure out how does that look like in the virtual world? Um, the one that hit me, I was at a symposium yesterday, University of Maryland had a PM symposium and somebody hit me up with a question. They said, um, what, what do you do for like, you know, we used to like take the team out for like bowling or pizza or whatever, like, how do you do that? And uh, I, I, I had an idea and I, I can't show you on screen because I have it blurred out in the background and you'll be able to see it. But um, one of the groups I work with, they did, they did like a painting party like online, like video like this, there's companies where you can order like paint materials and there's a person who comes on as a facilitator and they take out their thing and say, okay, everybody take out your canvas now. Like they send you a kit in advance. Mm -hmm. You do a painting party, you get wow. a glass of wine, soda, beer, whatever you drink, water. And, and you sit there and you sip and you chuckle and you show, hey, this is what mine looks like. And, and Lovely. it was actually a great bonding virtual thing that you can do. Mm -hmm. And we weren't so much doing it because of the coronavirus. We're doing it because we work in different places, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I have a team I'm working on right now where we're in two locations in Virginia and one in, in West Virginia. Even if we were all on site, which we're not, we still wouldn't be all together. So I think we're going to find that the world is such that, and it was like this before, honestly, before the pandemic, I, I would teach classes to uh, a major bank that is around the world. Mm. And everybody would ask questions in the PMI ICP class, like, how do I do planning poker with my team? <laughs> and I was like, oh, easy, set up a poll, like a live poll mm -hmm. while you're in a web conference, set up a poll, everybody votes, and then the facilitator shows all the answers to everybody. And then you see the Brilliant. distribution. So it's like, there, we just got to figure out how do I use the tools to do the things that I would normally do. Um, Phil, I never know if you're in the UK or in the States, other <laughs> than the fact that I get what time your video is published, like it makes a difference. But because um, I, I get those early morning ones, I'm like, whoa, he's in the wrong late or he's in a different time. To, but, um, but, you know, that, 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 I, I love that we can operate virtually because I can work with people that I love to work with. 
that I can't necessarily get in a car or plane to go work with. And so um, we just got to find ways to connect like that. And, and I'm, I tend to be on the side of over communicating with people, making sure. a lot of just pick up the phone, good old fashioned phone call. How's it going? Um, yeah. A lot of people I work with are techies. Mm. They do not want to be on video. I get it. I don't really think I'm getting video a lot of times either. I, I made sure I had a collared shirt today for, but you know, <laughs> a lot of times it's a t-shirt, yoga pants, like that's, you know, um, just the way it is. But, but I, I don't want people to feel uncomfortable about it, you know? So, so just, um, it's about building trust. That's, mm-hmm. that's my fundamental thing. It's about building trust. It is so much easier and it always will be easier in person to build trust. That being said, you can build it virtually. It's just a little bit harder. You got to put a little bit more effort forward and it'll take a little bit longer. So my recommendation, if you're working a virtual team, if possible, get together at the beginning or mm-hmm. once a year and that'll be enough. I mean, honestly, I haven't, I haven't seen Mark for a few years, but we we did meet shortly after we started working together. And I, I think that's I think that's the only time we've been in, in person. I'm mm. trying to think. I think it was the one class that we taught together. I don't know, <laughs> but like we don't even know after a while. Right? <laughs> yeah. But but it's like but if you that initial meeting mm. is really really far, mm. really far. In fact, they say once a year, but I would say I would even forgo that for when you start the project, meet everybody in person. Yeah. You could be, you could be good for five ten years, like literally, because there's something. There's something we innately get. And I, I related to like my dogs, right? So dogs, when you walk in a room, like a dog's going to like you or not, I, I, it's just some instinctual thing they get. We at some level, human beings, we are instinctual about person. There's like an, there's like an essence of a person we have not figured out yet. And maybe Mark Zuckerberg with the meta, <laughs> metaverse, we'll figure it out. But we have not yet figured out how do we get that essence virtually? We, we haven't figured that out. Um, and, and I can tell you, I, I know it because my animals can't sit in front of the video camera and look at a cat and start growling at it. But if you put that <laughs> cat in the same room, they certainly will. Right. And so there's something, there's something there in the physical space, but what, can, what can we do to connect and relate and build trust? And once you, once you have that, I think you can work virtually and, and I've always been a proponent of it. And I think it's because I traveled a lot for many years for work. So the idea of me being able to work with the people I want to work with, but I don't have to get in the car or get in a plane. I, I love it. I really do. And I, I love where I live. I get to live where I live and, and I get to work with anyone and I'm not bound by that. So I, that part I really do like, but I, but I appreciate the fact that nothing's a substitute for seeing people in person. So. Great stuff, Susan. Mark, from the world where you were in IT managing projects, Till now, do you see an uptake in how much uh, virtual stuff and uh, cameras and stuff uh, needs to be in position for one to succeed as a PM? Would you agree? Yeah, definitely. Um, we were kind of on the cutting edge. So even mm-hmm. in the 90s, um, Hewlett Packard, a lot of us work from our homes. And I hardly managed any local projects. I had teams spread across the United States, some, sometimes international projects and stuff. We didn't have Zoom, so we didn't. We weren't using the video, just conference calls and things. But um, and, and I think HP and a lot of companies, even at that time, they saw that it actually allowed people to be more productive. <laughs> um, if it was done right, people were professional, they were more productive and stuff. Um, so I definitely see the need for that. Uh, I, I really enjoy the face-to-face contact and the inter- I, I think I'm a much better teacher in front of the audience, you know, in the classroom and mm-hmm. stuff. That means a lot, like Sus- Susan's describing, you know, there's just something intangible that happens in the classroom that you can't get through this. This is great. This is awesome seeing you too, but um, you can't get everything in Zoom. And, Mm -hmm. And even though um, I could work from home, um, I would drive into the office at least once a week and spend Mm. the better part of, you know, half a day or at least several hours in one of the touch, we called them touchdown spaces and stuff, just so I could uh, rub elbows, 
and you know give some grief to my buddies and have my friends give grief to me that was that was part of the deal so i need that absolutely so, mark i think that alludes to what the what the next chapter is going to be i don't think it's going to be all virtual i think it's going to be a hybrid and not hybrid as in agile and traditional like our book but hybrid as in some virtual some in the office space uh one of one of my colleagues she's a mechanical engineer She's now doing this. She's got Tuesdays through Thursdays, she's in the office. And then Mondays and Fridays, she's at home. And I, I asked her about it. I'm like, well, would you rather be at home the whole time? She goes, no, I actually like it. She's like, I like getting dressed. I like going in the office. She's like, I got a long commute. So I'm glad to not have to do it on Mondays and Fridays. But yeah. she's like, I like the being in the office sometimes and not being in the office other times. And she she gives herself, you know, four days, four days at home, three days in the office. At first she was doing it like every other day. And she didn't like that as much like that. That seemed to muck up her routine a little bit more. So she likes she likes breaking it up like that. But I, I do think that that's going to be the new thing is a lot of organizations are going to go like to semi um, semi remote work mm. you know, hybrid, a hybrid solution. Um, you know, for myself, I do I do like being 100 percent virtual. But like I said, I, I can honestly say that I do think it makes a difference. You know, one one of the groups I work with, we're we're gonna have a picnic, and you know, I'm gonna I'm make a long drive. It's like four hours away, but I'm gonna show, wow. up. Mm. I'm gonna show up because because three hours at that picnic will give me a year's worth of benefit because mm. it'll be like, oh, I remember Susan because everybody's just it's just different when you meet somebody in person, and it, and it I is. um I, I I honor that, I recognize it, and so you. You got to put the you got to put the effort in to build that. It builds trust. I mean, that's basically what it comes down to. Absolutely, what you said just reminded me of a client of mine. They call Cabot Corporation out of Boston. Before they gave me, awarded us the contract to to train and and coach and mentor them in one of those uh, big symposiums they had. They actually wanted me to fly out to Boston, sit down, have dinner, meet with them, meet with the execs, and just get to build trust. You know, I think a lot of folks today, like, oh, why do I have to travel? Why do I? No, there's a lot of value from it. If you look at the work of the great Professor Emeritus Albert Morabian, his 5538 formula, I talk about it all the time, but uh, Forbes here, they, they try to explain it. And it, it says nonverbal communication is a very important aspect of our day-to-day -day life. Many powerful leaders have recognized this and they go through all of this. I put the link in the chat for people to read. But they go into Professor Emeritus Albert Morabian's experiments at UCLA, and it's called the, the 73855. I call it the 5538-7 rule. And a lot of people incorrectly teach this. A lot of people just flat out say, when you communicate, 55% is the body language. And uh, not exactly. What Morabian was trying to say is that in a situation where the communication has to do a lot with empathy, it has to do with a heartfelt message, it's a very sensitive thing you're trying to communicate, go with face-to-face -face as much as possible because the messages you're trying to convey when empathy is involved, 55% of that message is going to come across through your body language, 38 from your tone of voice, and only 7% is the word. So that's what he was trying to say. Now think about it. When you're meeting someone for the first time, a lot of empathy involved. There's a lot of heartfelt <laughs> stuff you're trying to convey. And that's why, like Susan said, I would drive down to that place. I would, you know, I would get on that plane because people are really going to get the essence of you and what you're trying to co communicate and what you're <clears> about. <throat> There's another page that I'll, I'll share here in the chat for those watching on YouTube. You go on down to um, Wikipedia, you can see the richness of communication. It gets better and better. First of all, we've got documents and then got radio and then telephone. Like soon as I pick up the, the phone, that's great. And then a level above that is going to be the video conferencing and boom, face to face. You just get the full on message. <clears throat> and that's why I encourage people where possible, you know, just do that. But look at video conference and it's close, you know, Zoom, Teams. It's close, but you have some people like Susan said, no, I'm a technical person. I often tell people I'm coaching project managers, even if they don't turn on the phone, turn on the webcam, you turn on your webcam. Don't just go with voice only because the richness of what you're trying to convey is going to come across so much more. You know, like one of my mentees, it's like, Phil, I, I don't want them to think I'm, I'm, I'm saying what I'm not. I'm like, then turn on the webcam. Everyone else doesn't. 
turn yours on. I, f- I find a lot of people don't understand why the webcam, the why behind the why. It's the closest you'll get to what agile spouses has been in the same room, right, Susan? That's what we, what do we say in the world of um, the manifesto? The uh, agile princi- oh, principle, it's, what? It's, it's the, it's Principles, the, it's the, yeah. Yeah, it's the, it's the, it's the, um, the idea that uh, there's no substitute for face-to-face communication is the best exactly. way to communicate with one another. Exactly. And, and, and that's a perfect example. Like people used to say to me, oh, you can't do agile virtually. You can't do agile virtually. You can, <laughs> and you got to use some, some tools to do that. And what I would say is have that initial kickoff where it's face-to-face. After that, I do think you can. I, I, yeah. I, I think you can, you can create, not only can you do it, you can create equally good results that's that's yeah. really the key you can do anything but you can actually perform you can perform yeah. but I, I think that face to face to start with and then in the video cam and you know i i'm with you like i don't, I don't look at my face all day like it's kind of like <laughs> it's a weird thing you know maybe we'd be better off if you couldn't see yourself but then i feel like that's worse because then but if your hair is messed up or whatever you know but um but the but but there is, um, you know, for one, if you're working with your team members, you can say, you know, I really don't care if you're wearing a sweatshirt. Like, I mean, we we got into the point with with certain people, like they don't care, they don't care. You know, I I have rules for myself. I try to have a collar on. But if I'm working with people that I know, I'll just I'll just be wearing my sweatshirt, and I don't Absolutely. care. Yeah. 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 Um. But there, but um. And the other thing is too, yeah, you can put your video on even if the other person doesn't, and you can tell them you put it on if you want or don't if you don't. Uh, when I teach my students, I, I always, always am on video. I say to them, that is it's, great. Like, it's like the Wizard of Oz. Like you need to know there's a person behind the behind the <laughs> curtain, right? Um, and then the, the other thing is that um, one of my colleagues who's done a lot of presenting, he actually was, used to be in radio. He says whenever he presents and there's an option for video, he'll turn on that little video. And he's like, listen, I don't think I'm anything to look at. He's got the headset on. Right. And um, and you, you know him, Mark. I won't say his full name, but Carl. You, you oh, yeah. Mark. Yeah. Carl. Carl. Very Carl. engaging. Risk. Risk. Carl. Carl. Yeah. We'll put it that way. Yeah. So he, he he's got his headphones on. And he's like, I know I'm not much to look at. He's like, but it's, there's just something about that. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. It's just about being relatable. It's just about people being like, oh, there's Carl. And the funny thing is we individually care more about what we look like than anyone else looking at us. Yeah. Like, mm-hmm. honestly, and Oops. that's, 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 um, you know, there may be some gender things going on there too. I don't know, but, but I will say that I, I pay a lot more attention to what I look like. If somebody else has got like, whatever, something's not right. I, I really don't care. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, it's, so it's just funny that we care about something that other people don't care about. They, that's they care true. about our message. Yeah. It's really about the, the value in what one is given, giving a full rich message. You know, it's just so much more rich to have the full. I can't imagine the difference between not seeing you folks versus seeing you. Not only does it give me a lot of happiness to see my buddies, but at the same time, just seeing your facial expressions and your body language, it just goes a a whole longer, further than just hearing. Then you have to imagine how you know, you would be when you're saying those things. But, you know, I'm speaking about Carl. He's just so animated. He's very yeah. animated. Yeah. So it's seeing be the him. Most dynamic, add... animated just... person. Yeah. And, it, and excited. He gets excited. Exactly. Different. He gets excited. So it just adds more, much more value, you know. In I, my I think mind. there's also genuineness. Like you, yeah. you can tell if someone's being genuine by looking at them. Absolutely. You know? Yeah. And, and and then there's like the certain the certain character like we all have our own character and um you know you've got your 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 marketable sunglasses there your <laughs> shades um, that, that that makes you look you're the cool project manager <laughs> Mark's always got like his his like standard issue like button down shirt yeah I I wore this because of Mark. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what my thing is, but that's, you're never aware of your thing, but it's usually like the, the hair in the bun and making the glasses or something. I don't know. Um, my husband says the glasses make me look smarter. So I, 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 I go with it. Um, so, um, but, but yeah, I mean, there's something, it's definitely, you get, you get that sense of genuineness. I you think do. Absolutely. When you, see people, you see people, their expressions on their face and um, 
I probably should spend a lot more time thinking about the non the non verbals that I put ahead. Um, I'm not good at, at noticing the nonverbal cues. Some people are really good at noticing them. And I think the people who are good at noticing them are also good at positioning themselves with them. Mm. So yeah, someone it, said, listen to what is not said. And what is not said is said through the body language, but not said mm. verbally. So yeah. but the wow. thing the thing I am good at doing is creating an intention. Mm. So I, I create an intention. Like every time I talk, every time I present, I create an intention. And I, I would say my intention here is that um, people be aware, um, be energized about project management, be excited about possibilities, be op optimistic about what's going on in the project management arena. And so, so that's the intention I come to present, right? Mm. And so no matter what I'm talking about, people are like, wow, I really liked what you presented. And what it is, is that they liked my positive energy, mm -hmm. my engagement, my optimism, my, my personality. And, and so anyone can do that. So even if you're not great at like body language, if I showed up today and said to myself, Hmm, my intention is that people are just going to be like upset and frustrated. <laughs> and better, like I would come in the room whether yeah. you're not and I would bring it down. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, we, we, we all have that capacity to yep. raise the room up or to bring it down. And it's your, it's your intention. And for people who like perform, people who act, people who present, they all know about this. They take that moment to kind of like, okay, what am I doing? And Tony Robbins is excellent for that. Mm -hmm. like, you can YouTube Tony Robbins. Like he has a whole thing he does. Oh yeah. That's my guy. He, yeah. He like turns himself on. Like he we does. have it he's, that he's just always on. The energizer point, bunny. That guy is asleep at night and he <laughs> wakes up in the morning. Like he must go through something to get there. And he's and, an anomaly. Just and, his voice is, yeah. is going to create a disruption in your mood. Just hearing mm -hmm. Tony. That and you know crazy. what's funny about that? He has had problems with his vocal cords. He's had mm. like surgeries and like literally like lost his voice. So he when he goes and presents, he can only talk for a certain amount of time. Like the doctor's wow. like, so isn't that amazing? Like his voice is so present yeah. and yet that's like his thing that he's struggling with. So I, I find that very interesting and mm. it's called him to have to get other people to help him mm. to, to engage with him. And so it's very, it's funny how life comes at you. Like the point of life is your own growth and development. Mm. So once you conquer something, which shows up, is something that will bring you to that next level. So like, yes, his voice is amazing. What he has to say is amazing. And now he's fighting with that. So what is he doing? Now he's inspiring other people to mm -hmm. speak for him. Wow. Yeah. So that's pretty neat. And pretty cool story. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if people know um, Bob Proctor. He's also oh, yeah. in space. Bob that's Proctor so. just yeah. passed away. I don't know yeah. if anyone knows that. He has a collection. You know how I'm celebrating him, memorializing him? I still listen mm -hmm. to his videos that are on YouTube and I hope they're there forever. Like mm -hmm. we actually are lucky in this day and age because people pass and there's still some space for them. Like if you're a content creator, you, your, your content's going to live, outlive you. Mm -hmm. Right. So the think about that, like what, what a, what a thing to come to, like if my content's going to outlive me, how am I going to show up when I create you know, sure. yeah. Jack is, Jack is waving or giving a high yeah. five. Because yeah, Jack's giving a high five. Welcome. Okay. Feel free to put a comment in the chat. So, going to this topic that we've been kind of circling around, but again, a shout out to you, Susan, for putting this um, curriculum, I would call it together. A lot of the folks who are here on YouTube and coming in, they're obviously PMI geeks, because I think this is probably like next level type of discussion. They're people who are just looking for PMP. They're going to tap out and say, I need, I need my knowledge areas. So they're going to tap out. And I understand that. But those who are certified, they probably should listen into, you know, people who've been on this, on this journey for a while. Mark's been, I was counting. I'm like, no, he can't be 27. No, no, no. It's 27 years, Mark. Crazy. 27 years. Whew. <laughs> so they, sh they should listen to what we have to say. So let's start off the conversation about Agile and why Agile. And before I just uh, hand over to you uh, and uh, Susan, let's go here to just underscore what I was racking my brains to remember. It's funny how it just vanishes when you're looking for it. The most efficient and effective method of conveying information 
to and within a development team is face-to-face -face conversation. And that, that's the principle I was looking for. Right. But let's go back to the whole discussion about Agile, because back in the day, people thought you can you can even be Agile, except you're all in the same room. So what are your thoughts about Agile and the way forward? Would you agree that every project should at least have some Agile thinking, even if they've got a predictive approach? Would you agree? Uh... Um, I would say it depends. That that answer we hate. That <laughs> answer, uh, the answer the students uh, in our PNP prep classes or even agile classes, you they say, well, "What does PMI recommend for the right way to approach and do this?" And you always get up and you say, "It depends." So where it does not, where it does not apply, would be a lot of the types of projects that I worked on <laughs> in my in my experience at HP. So I did a lot of logistics projects so before I moved into program management and such. Um, so data center relocations, what we called rollouts. So a large customer, large enterprise customer is doing a refresh of all their clients, uh, PCs, laptops, and even supporting servers and over a large geography, sometimes even international and stuff. We had done so many of those types of projects, we could do them in our sleep. We didn't need a, we didn't need a Microsoft project schedule or plan. We could do it off of a spreadsheet. So these were what I called cookie cutter. They were, they were incredibly good templates from previous projects, there were historical records. We knew we could um, estimate time and cost very, very accurately. We were, the company was very sure they were making a, a nice profit. The margins were, were very, very good on all this type of stuff. So we didn't, in that world, you know, it was predictive and you needed your quote unquote command and control uh, project manager, the accountable, person, the one, the one throat to choke, who was accountable, who was a spokesperson, um, he or she is a spokesperson to the customer, uh, their management team, and your management team, your sponsor and the senior managers, other people involved. And um, that was that was my world in the 90s and stuff. That was the stuff I was doing. But what is our world today? For these young for the younger generation of project managers, you know, in the last two decades, and Tom Friedman describes very, very well in, in several of his recent books how we got to this. And it was really the breakup of the Soviet Union that ushered in a whole era of globalization. And it was the internet that changed, turned everything upside down. And now today, there's such a heightened level of competition, much more so in the past few decades, two decades and a half. And with the internet, things are happening so much faster. And the example we put together in our book, um, I said, imagine there's a group of young entrepreneurs who have a great business idea for a new product, a new solution, and they're very confident this could work. This could have, you know, you know, really good uh, effect in the in the marketplace. So these young entrepreneurs, do they need the old brick and mortar manufacturing facilities? No, they can outsource that. How about marketing? No, they can go outside, outsource the marketing, the advertising. So they can cobble together. They can put together very, very quickly the solution. And that's happening all over the place today. So that that's leading to the volatility that exists today. So in our very highly competitive supercharged marketplace today with tremendous volatility, guess what? The uh, technological solutions that exist today could be totally outdated in a matter of months. So you had better do things iteratively. You'd better do things in very short iterations and kick the tires as you go along, have the customer do those, you know, have an iteration of one month or less, maybe even two weeks and stuff. Some of the agilists that I know in the chapter and people say they do one week or two week iterations. I really, I can't believe that, no way. But you'd better have 
at least a one month iteration or less and very frequent re, um, interactions with the customer, the product owner, the team to get feedback. So very fast feedback loops, find out what works, what doesn't work, what doesn't work, what uh, you know, a lot of people think something is absolutely necessary at the beginning. And again, another version of Pareto's law that uh, out of all our requirements, Jeff Sutherland goes through this example and multiple times in his, his great book, Scrum, the art of doing twice the work and half the time. And he goes through this example multiple times where they've got a pile of requirements that's three feet tall. <laughs> And then they start writing them down on the classic. They write them down as stories. They plaster the walls with all the stories and post-it notes and the cards. And then they start doing prioritization, right? And what do they end up finding out? I don't need this. I don't need that. I don't. And they reduce it down to the 20%. So Pareto's law in requirements is that 20% of the requirements will meet 80% of the need. So an agile you're going after that 20% very, very quickly, the most highest priority, the most urgent, the most risky. And you go after those in the first iterations, you create product increment, you create something tangible, empirical, you get it out there, you let them see it, find out what has value. And then stuff that doesn't have value, you take it out of the backlog and you just keep grooming that value chain. That's lean. Lean is at the heart. Lean is the driver of all this stuff. Sure. And in our in our world today, if you don't do that in, in a lot of at least in tech or a lot of marketplaces, you're toast. Mm -hmm. yeah. The DevOps people, the the authors of the DevOps handbook say point blank, they say companies that have not adopted lean, they're talking about manufacturing. But they're saying manufacturing companies that did not adopt lean are out of business mm. or have suffered a great reduction in their business. Makes sense. And I believe it. I believe it. I think that's mm. point on point. Absolutely. Susan, Phil, what do you... Am, great stuff. Am I, speaking, just... am I uh, preaching to the choir or what? No, no, I'm enjoying it. Look, like Mark, no matter how much one knows, one needs to regurgitate and... Right. Chew the cud, as it were, and, and milk that information and let it marinate because you just, we're human, right? So bad habits, they can kind of creep in. So hearing these things over and over again, just reinforces, no matter how good one is, one has to get this reinforcement. So hearing it from you in a very, I'd say more like an engineering, straight up engineering mindset is very, it's a helpful new perspective instead of just full-on agile terminology and dogma. So I like the way you wove it in. It helps, helps it marinate for me, and I really enjoy that. Thank you. So Susan and I, no, I want Susan to speak here. So she's very good at speaking. So <laughs> my help. But one thing, we hit, one thing we hit hard in our book is that don't forget traditional. Don't mm. forget yeah. waterfall. That in a large, complex project, there are going to be some work packages or going to be pieces of that project that are cookie cutter. And if they are cookie cutter, the type of things I did in the 90s, then guess what? It's going to be faster, more efficient and less expensive yep. to stick with the waterfall way. So, Susan, I'll let you uh, point out. Yeah, Susan so that, has that, a... that's, that's what I was going to say. I was going to kind of bring us back down. OK, and say, no. Traditional, like you just, you just don't want to throw it out. You don't want to throw it out because, because there are certain things. So if your scope is fixed, it's not going to change. It's not a lot of uncertainty associated with it. Um, there are certain things that that's going to make sense for. Um, construction is one that comes up a lot. Um, however, I will say there are certain parts of construction. So let's say you're building a new home. Um, you can wait on um, people picking out the, the fixtures for the kitchen sink and the bathroom sink or the hardware for the doors. They can, they can wait to pick those things out. So I think, I think you got to figure out where it works, where it doesn't work. And don't use agile where it doesn't belong. And don't use traditional where it doesn't belong. So I, I literally go to like, there's a reason you have a hammer and a screwdriver, mm -hmm. right? So you're like, no matter how good that hammer is, it will not work on screws. And no matter how good the screwdriver is, makes a really poor hammer. 
And so uh, let's let's not get rid of them, but let's learn how to use them together in a way that's most effective. Um, so we're not, you know, people think, well, if I apply agile, it'll be quicker and more efficient. Not where the scope is cons- is is going yeah. to be the same. It's well defined. Um, you know, you're paving a driveway. Really, you need to you need to meet every like day every morning to to talk about first of all it's probably gonna be done in one day second of all if you had to meet every hour and make it take longer um hopefully that the scope isn't changing you're like same driveway same pavement i want to you know it's like these things aren't going to yeah, change so there's sorry. certain things you know you, you it's traditional is the way yeah. to go so just know when that's appropriate and when it's not from a general perspective i'm going to make this statement um when the pandemic hit the companies that knew what true agility was not Mm -hmm. agile. Like I call it capital a agile, like the approach for project management, but the word agility companies that knew agility, they made it through it. People Mm -hmm. that knew agility, you're looking at three of them because we made it through it. We we still have our small businesses and we're still doing well. Um, So agility, what agility looks like is don't be married to what you thought you were going to do. Mm-hmm. Listen for what there is to do. What is the opportunity now? What do my customers need now? What's going on now? And that um, Simon Sinek had a great, um, I think it's on YouTube somewhere. It's just, it's a picture of him, but he's speaking to his team about what agility means. And he basically was like, you need to be agile or you're not going to be here. And he wasn't being mean. He was <laughs> just like, I don't mean in this company, like I mean, professionally, you are going to go away if you are not agile. We're also sitting on the precipice of artificial intelligence, robotics, things like that. Like, if you're not agile, guess mm. what? Your jo- job just got taken over by a robot or a robot. <laughs> so, so if you want to know what agility looks like, it's going to be that. So if you mm. haven't thought about before that, how to be agile, what that might look like. Um, and I'll give you an example from the pandemic. I think it was Texas Roadhouse. So, you know, restaurant, definitely a major issue. They had movies out in the parking lot. They got one of those big movie screen things, movies out in the parking lot. We bring the food to your car. So you still want to go out. You get to go out. You're in your car. You're safe. And we're still making food and you're still entertained. Mm. There you go. So he didn't, he didn't step out of his business. He just transformed his business to meet the customer needs and the, and the going situation. Um, that's, that's what agility looks like. You got to be able to pivot. And so from a, from a business perspective, everyone needs agility from Mm -hmm. a project management approach. You need to apply it where it works and don't apply it where it doesn't. Mm -hmm. So that's my, that's my sum. Lovely stuff. I love that example. I'm, I'm going to use that Susan. Thank you. I love uh, the pragmatism that you bring with the examples because that's been agile. Who would have thought Texas Roadhouse, who would have thought? You know, you could use an example from an establishment like that. But you're right. Agility is not about using Scrum and using XP or TDD. Yep. A lot of people, they get muddled up with this. And, and that's probably the next point I should touch on. Let's go on down to one of PMI's old reports that they had. I'm going to put the link in the chat. And... Um, it just reads here, it's one of the parts of the profession reports, agility where speed meets strategy. It says, agile organizations lead the pack. If project leaders and executives work together to build greater agility, they can solve problems, take smarter risks, and deliver innovative products and solutions to market faster. Just like what Susan said, that's a perfect example. Consider this, the average percentage of projects completed on time, on budget, achieving Business objectives and forecasted ROI is significantly greater in organizations reporting high agility than those reporting low agility. So take a look at the dark blue. Those are high agility on time. They beat those that are low agility on budget, meeting business goals. They do wildly different, like a differential of 24. That's just crazy. And meeting or exceeding ROI. So it just pays to have a higher level of agility. And agility is not by saying I'm using a scaled framework. It's not by that. A lot of people get it wrong. They get agility wrong at the base. 
it's a bit frustrating to me for organizations that I deal with. They start having this shiny object syndrome and they're like, Phil, I want to use that. And, you know, you see me being a, a crazy evangelist saying, stop saying safe is the answer to all of your problems. Some people think, oh, it's a magic wand. No, it's not. You just need to be agile in your thinking. So you see me being an evangelist on social media, telling people, stop going crazy over the so-called safe, shiny object. Don't do it. Don't even do it. Why not descale? Why not even just be agile in your thinking, agile in your behaviors? Because their actions are totally, you know, riddled in traditional and not agile. And yet they want to go into this world of, it's going to help us scale agile. No, you can't scale a mindset. It's a mindset first and foremost. So that, that's what irks and frustrates me, you know, because I've invested so much energy in these companies I train worldwide. And then some, some bright person who was employed yesterday says they want to implement, you know, it just frustrates me. And all of my hard work and my colleagues' hard work, mm. you want to like just go down the drain to this, you know, this rabbit hole of never ending um, they keep charging you year after year. Well, if you want to remain certified, that's going to be some additional dollars. So it frustrates me because people don't get the picture, which is why I put this thing up on the screen. So those organizations who think, you know, that, that one little framework can, can change the entire game. No, if you are not agile in your thinking, if you don't have agility at the base in the way you think, in the way you act, in the way you behave, you are not going to get very far. You're just going to keep forking out money and thinking that that change will come. You know, you know what I'm saying? So it, the, the expression adapt or die. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and, yeah. And, and it's, and it's funny because even like as a human being, like I still, I have this mindset, like eventually I will create the job situation where I'll be, have financial freedom and I'll be all set. And then I'm just going to go like retire or something. <laughs> and that'll be like a week off of work. And I'll be like, okay, I'm kind of bored. Like, I, wonder what's Mark, I wonder what Mark's doing. Hey, Mark, you want to go do something? I mean, that's why Mark is still here with gray hair. Because it's like, that's not, I mean, he plays tennis, he plays golf, but then it's like, okay, now I got to do something, do something mm -hmm. accomplished, right? Contribute. So like, we want to contribute. And you never, you never Create like, value you never actually like arrive, like you never get to that point. Cause mm. when you get to that point, you're like, okay, that's great. Now what do I want to do next? Like mm -hmm. that's why people who are truly wealthy financially do don't need to make money are still working. Exactly. Yep. It's about the journey. And yep. that's also why people who wait their whole life to retire, retire and sometimes die within a few months, within a year. It's, it's sad to say. But it's because, when you, when you don't have a purpose, when you're not going somewhere, when you're not adapting or changing or transforming, like you're kind of, you're kind of gone. Like we are about adapting, transforming. That's what we're about. Mm -hmm. So I think we have it. Like there's like this, there's this like utopian moment we're going to have in our, in our living life. And it's, it's not going to happen. Like, I don't think it's going to happen. I know that's, that's yeah, okay. that little existential here for a moment, <laughs> but, but, but it's, but it's true. I mean, yeah. you, you just, it's about transformation. And that's why when people talk about implementing agile, I, I say agile transformation plan. That's, that's what I call it. And so when my students submit their final, it's an agile transformation plan. I do that on purpose mm. because it's, it's about shifting the mindset. So whenever they provide an agile transformation plan and it has no training in it, I'm like, mm. where's the training? Where's the training? How are you getting there without training? Yep. You know, and this is this is transformational training. You know how you know something's transformational training? Once you get it, you can't undo it. Mm -hmm. Right? What's not transformational training is you tell me, here's a list of 10 bullets, memorize them. Okay, well, yeah. the moment I forget them, the training's over. Now I got to go take the training again. <laughs> Transformational training isn't like that. It shifts your mindset such that you can never go back, which is a little scary to people sometimes because people don't want to change like that. But, but when you shift to that agile, that way of looking at things and thinking about things, you truly will not forget it and cannot go back. And if you can forget it and go back, then it wasn't transformation. That's how you know the difference between training and transformation. But I mean, I talk about it as training, but when you're when you're doing agile, you're really transforming the mindset of the organization. Mm -hmm. 
Absolutely. That's, that's part of why I so vehemently protect organizations I've trained because I don't want them thinking there's the shiny red button. We're going to press it and everything is going to change and it's automatically going to scale from, you know, just linearly up like that. No, because you've got people there that are <clears throat> doing scrum and they're just so warped in their thinking. It's not even agile. No, it's corrupted. No. Corrupted, yeah. Let's increase our velocity. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Yep. Oh, I know I, yeah. I know an easy way to increase your velocity. Make a user story point of one <laughs> equal to a user story point of five. And now just exactly. do everything else. And you know, the funny thing, management in many companies, they don't get it. So when they're forcing and coercing the team to mimic someone else's velocity, the team, they, they just stop bad behaviors. And that's not agile. And it's, it's frustrating. But you know, that's for a different day. <laughs> that's for a different day. To, to, to round up, because we've been going pretty hard here. We've been, we've been going for over an hour. So, let, so let's take a look at certifications. We've talked a little bit about some of PMIs. Is there anything you want to add to the mix about certifications here? Um, Susan, this is... A I'm a certification collector. I, well, I'm just gonna say this is my thing. I, I, I have 15 or 17, I'm not sure. Wow. Um, that happens when you get a lot of them. Um, <laughs> I have nine agile certs from four different certifying bodies. Wow. I, I don't recommend you get more than one scrum cert. I have more than one because in order to teach it, you need to have it, okay? Yeah. So, so my rationale for getting certifications is more about teaching certifications. But mm. what I recommend to people when you go to get a certification, figuring out which one, look, look at the job requirements. Like look at, if you want to be a program manager, you want to be a project manager, you want to be a portfolio manager, what does the job ask for and what does the job recommend? So I use that to drive it. Um, the other thing that I do is some of my certifications I truly have gotten for the opportunity to learn. Um, so, so for example, the PMI uh, ACP, um, not only did I get that to to have uh, the, the certification so I could teach it, but I also got it so I could learn about some of these different agile methods that I didn't know about at the time. So th that was really, really valuable to me. So that's another reason to get certs. And I just like to learn constantly. I like continuous learning. So I try to pick out one or two that I'm going to get per year. Um, most organizations are going to help you to some degree with that. And if they're not going to, they're at least going to recognize your efforts that you put forward to get a certification. Um, but I'm always looking at like, what's that next step? What's that next place? Um, right now, the certifications I'm looking at getting are cybersecurity and leadership, agile leadership. Mm. Um, we, don't, we don't talk about agile leadership a lot, but I think that's really important. You just got one, Phil. I just saw it on Linkday. the other that's day. That's true. Yes. I did. I did the um, so the agile leadership with Ken Schreiber's company. That one, yes. Yeah, yes. I did that last year. I did the PAL one, yep. and I did the SPS um, scale professional Scrum. You know, and you just like you said, you have to remain relevant. When I started teaching um, agile for PMP, I decided that um, my my CSM needed a little you know revamp, and since you can't do that. I decided to just go for the PSM and Roy, who is my agile coach, he's very inspirational and charismatic about agile. So he keeps giving me this agile Kool-Aid to drink. So I got the PSM, I got the PSPO, I got the PAL, I got the SPS. And he's like, oh, Phil, Phil, <laughs> calm down. You're going quite hard, I, buddy. <laughs> I, I, I know Roy, he's very engaging in that regard. Um, he knows me too. We, we actually, we, we've had the same uh, client company that we did. He did say for. that. Yeah, he did um, say he knows you. Mm -hmm. It's funny, the, the world the world goes round. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I think they're fun. I think they're interesting to get, but um, I don't expect everybody to just get a whole bunch of them. So so look look to where you want to go. That's what, you, that's what you want to get. And then the other opportunity there is, is just project management training in general, just to like sharpen sharpen the sword. Um, you know, the, everybody here, Mark, myself, Phil, we, we all do uh, training that does not lead to certs. Yeah. Um, you can go to universities, you can get a master's degree in project management and things like that. Um, but, but I say, you know, every year you should be sharpening that sword, uh, the sword, so to speak, mm -hmm. or the saw. 
I, I guess sword of the saw. Would be <laughs> the saw, the saw. <laughs> depending yeah. on depending if you're cutting down trees or you're or you're fighting battles. Um, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I mean, it's I I think it's really important. Um, project management, unlike so, I come from an engineering background. So mechanical engineering, the distance between the studs in your house has not changed since you've been alive. I think I don't know how old people are on this call. <laughs> But it probably hasn't changed since my dad's been alive and he's 94. So wow. um, there are there are certain things that change, but, um, you know, mechanical engineering kind of things like requirements for construction. Electricals changed a little bit. There's a few different things like how far away the, the, the electric outlets on the wall, like that's changed a little bit. But project management is so young and immature compared to those things. And so when people say, well, where's project management going? And this is kind of a nice way to sum this up. It's going where, where we take it, where we as project management professionals say it needs to go, say we want it to go, and where it should go to meet that, that our customers' needs. So it's it's not been decided. And, and I don't think that even PMI gets to decide that. I think that we as professionals get to decide where it goes. Um, and that's why we come and we speak and we you know present and go to conferences because because the reality is, is that what we say makes a difference in how people think and how people approach things. And we make a difference to each other um, just, as, just as much, if not more, than, than a certifying body does. Um, so, so where is it going is it's where, where we say it needs to go to accomplish the things we need to accomplish. Um, and there's, there's, a lot, there's a lot to happen out there in the world. Um, and I am confident that anything of purpose that's going to happen in our world is going to happen through project management, whether, whether people admit it or not. That, that is how we get things done. So that's why, that's why we're in this field, because it's, it's unending. Mm. We'll always have, we'll always have something well, to do. Very well said. Absolutely. All right. Well, a few little questions for our viewers. I know some of them have been in and out. They haven't been able to stay as a result of their work, but I appreciate them stopping by. If you could, please drop a comment below or in the chat. We want to know, is Agile used in your firm? Did you take the exam in 2021 or 2022? And we would also uh, like to know, will you take another PMI certificate in the next three years? Just drop us a comment when you're able. And um, as far as our purpose, our intention, someone says, why do you folks do this? Well, we do it for sense making. We want to make sense out of our community, out of project management. We are in a very unique space in that in the world of PMI that we are, we find ourselves being very agile and at the same time, very traditional. So we've got the best of both worlds. There are not a lot of companies or a lot of certifications that force you to make the best of both worlds. It's either agile to the extreme or, or predictive to the extreme, but we're, we're kind of in the middle. So Mark, I'd like you to kind of round up for us and uh, give people some food for thought as we close down. Hey, no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, I think we've talked a lot. I think we said a lot. Um, are there... Do they have the ability to ask any questions, Phil? Uh, we that didn't get any questions up. from, yeah, we didn't get any questions from uh, YouTube at this time. And uh, I should have opened it up to a wider audience, but we've had a lot of um, bots in the past uh, just chatting in non-value stuff. So I just left it open to our subscribers. As far as subscribers, no, I don't see any questions from our subscribers just yet. Right. No, seriously, I don't... Um can't think of anything real cogent or substantive to add on to, a, you know, all the stuff that we've gone through. We've, yeah, uh, we did, we did a great job. A lot. We did a great job today and we stayed out of the landmines for the most part. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't, we didn't go full Monty on, uh, on our yeah. friends in Pennsylvania this time. So, well, I there's a lot of uncertainty with, uh, with where PMI is going really mm -hmm. in the, next uh, couple of years as a new CEO mm. um, in PMI. So I, I don't even know the CEO's name. Do, do you either of you? <laughs> you mean the acting CEO? Oh, so they haven't named a permanent to replace Sunil? 
It's so the, still- well, the, the acting CEO is, is Mike DePrisco. He's been there for some months. And um, okay. as far as anyone, the, like a real replacement for right. Sunil. Now, I, I know Mike's holding down the fort. Um, I know Tony Appleby was uh, also uh, holding down the fort. But apart from those two individuals, I'm not aware of anyone else who is a contender to be CEO at this time. It's really taken some time because it's going to six months now right. and still no CEO. So who knows? Who knows? But, you know, I think things have evened out a little bit um, as far as the way forward. And, and for anyone in, in this profession, like Susan said, just keep sharpening the saw. Don't get PMP certified and rest on your laurels. The problem with a lot of individuals, they get PMP and they believe the doors are going to suddenly open as though by magic. It's not going to happen. <clears throat> you got to keep sharpening that saw, making yourself relevant, you know, being bold to, to get in front of bad behaviors that you see in your firm, bad mindsets, be a leader. And that's really it. Everything is going to rise and fall on how well you lead, how well you influence. So for people who are getting certified as PMPs, well, welcome to the crab barrel because everyone's trying to get out of that barrel. All the crabs trying to get out. What makes you unique in the 1.2 million PMPs is the question. If all you're doing is getting certification and then picking up this book and saying, oh, I'll never have to read any of that stuff again. Well, um, seventh isn't a good example of that. <laughs> Something else, you know, yeah, you'll never have to read those other books again. If that's your mindset, it's wrong. You need to, to listen to what Susan said. Sharpen the saw and the sword because you're going to get in battles with crazies who say it has to be all agile or you're, you're an imposter or you're, you're a heretic if it's not all, all traditional. No. So you you got you to gotta sharpen your weapons because you, you will come across the crazies. They're out there. You know? So balance is key. Being courageous and be a, be a lifelong learner. Just like Susan said, 17 certifications. Right, right. Wow. <laughs> Congratulations. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> well, right. Thank you so much, Phil, for putting this together. Yeah. Great to see you too. Uh, Susan, Phil, great to see you too. And glad uh, things are going well. And this old dude will some, get, get uh, <laughs> back into things and re-engineer some of the hybrid classes that, that we've been working on and put that out there. Awesome. Thank you, Mark. And then thank you, Susan. And thanks for all the value that I mean, this is just a thing of value. We could close the doors like we have in the past and meet just three of us amongst ourselves and our, our buddies who've been on those other calls. But for today, this was actually Susan's uh, catalyst. Susan got, got us you know, thinking, it's been a while and uh, this is why we're here. So Susan, do you wanna share your, um, your contact information so I can put it on the screen in the chat? Just share it with me and I'm gonna put it on the screen because some folks may wanna get hold of you directly. Yeah, I'll put, yeah. I'll put my you. email address. Thank you. Yes, up. please. And and um, you got a website, don't you? The tech. Uh, there we go. All yeah, right. No, so. that's fine. You can, you can do that. You can find me on LinkedIn. Um, I'm actually in the process of revamping my website, so uh, so it's probably not really great at the moment. So okay. So um, let me just put it up on the screen so folks can see it if they need to get hold of you directly. Because a lot of folks they definitely will subscribe to the great knowledge you shared. I want them to be able to get hold of you. So yep. this is this is your email address right there at the top. Yep. Right? S3. Yeah, you can put you can put my full name in there in case I didn't get it. Susan Parente. Parent with an E. And uh, yeah, so if you if you want to find me on LinkedIn, that's also a great place to to find me. And um, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's been great. Um, Phil, you have, you have great content. Like I said, I, I, I wake up in the morning, I you know, pick up my phone, which is my alarm clock, and there's usually like some video from Phil. <laughs> so um, so I, uh, I, I appreciate that. And, and that's what inspired me is I was like, you know, this the, the talent triangle thing. I was like, what, what, what's the future like here? So what I don't want us to do is think that the future for project management is dictated by PMI. Yes. Or, mm -hmm. or, or anybody, any, mm -hmm. any, you know, it's, it's us. Now, how do we get together to actually make the, what we think happen? Uh, one of the things that I do is, is video content like this, presentations, webinars, conferences, but that's where this gets created. You know, ideas, ideas get created by all of us. I think, you know, as you get older, you start to see that you, 
you don't always have to go look up at the, the highest person on the pedestal for the idea. A lot of times the person down on the ground's got a great idea, you know? Absolutely. Um, in fact, they have a better perspective. Sometimes people in different places have different perspectives. And so um, let's let's not be let's not be attached to we're gonna wait for somebody to come up with a solution. We can be the ones creating that. And um and that and that's really interesting. That makes me want to get out of bed in the morning and go to work because I know that that we can create something really great and we don't have to wait for someone else to create it. Um, and that doesn't mean I'm going to start a standardization company, but I will tell you this, if I know someone doing it, I'm, I'm going to hop on and help them. Absolutely. Because, um, we, we, we want things to be done well. I mean, it's one of the reasons I teach. You don't make a lot of money teaching as a university professor. True. But what you, what you do do is you make sure that the people who took your class go out and do project management, like they know what they're doing. Mm. Um, and, and, and just some of the basic things of like, just being, having integrity with your word about when you're not on schedule, when things aren't going right, you're getting communication. It's just, just things like that, that I think that some of my students probably get, get some heartburn over, <laughs> over how serious I am. But then a few years later, they're doing, they're doing project management work and they're like, man, that was really valuable. Like, mm. you know, it's so, so it, at the moment, it might be painful, but in the long run, it's like I want to create. I want to. I want to create an environment where project managers take project management as seriously as I do, mm. um, and also have fun with it. But are not trying to cut corners, are trying to are doing things the right way and following good practices. And so, one of the ways I do that is by teaching. And when mm. I teach, I not only touch that student, but I actually shift the way they think. And then they can go back to their company and, and shift that. So we don't realize the, the impact we have um, until we start, you know, doing, doing what matters to us. And so, I don't know, in, in, the, in the end, maybe I end up affecting more people because, because what I'm doing is something that's a little bit more unique than, you know, publishing a book that say, hey, you have to read this and take an exam. Like, you know, a lot of people just take the exam, check the box, walk away. True. But there may be something that we say to people that will stay with them for a lifetime. Um, right. I had a student just just in an agile class say that that not not only did they learn something that the agile class literally changed the way that they think mm -hmm. in life about everything in life and and in their profession. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's pretty Love awesome, it. unbelievable. That's pretty that's pretty awesome, and and you know it's funny too because it's not something I said; it's the space that I taught inside of. That's where I think of myself as I facilitate a classroom learning experience, which means that you as a student have something to contribute. Mm -hmm. I create a space where everybody in the classroom gets to contribute to everybody else. Mm -hmm. That's why she walked away with that. It wasn't something I specifically told her. It's a, it was a forum of discussion that lasted for the semester that she got that from. Um, wow. I, I can say I created a space where that was possible. And that, that's something to do, but it's not, it's not even like something I'm uniquely saying. It's just something that it's a place where people can talk about things. Mm. And, and that's, that's huge. And she's, she's a mover and shaker. She's doing lots wow. of stuff. So, so very uh, cool. Very cool. Love it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Great stuff. Great content. I'm going to go back, listen to this again and get some more value from it. Okay, Thanks, buddy. folks. Thanks again. All right. Thank Thanks you, everyone. If you're watching on YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, wherever you're watching, we appreciate you joining us and uh, keep doing all the great things Mark and Susan right. advised. Thank you.